muted. Hi everyone, welcome to the Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series. We're about to get started in just a few moments. Uh, we look forward to, to speaking with you soon. And thank you for joining us today. Today we'll be talking about sports-based mentoring. I'm Desiree Robertson, and I'll be facilitating today's conversation around Get Moving, using sports-based programming to bridge mentoring gaps. Let's get started. This webinar is part of the Collective uh, Mentoring Webinar Series, which is funded by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention through the National Mentoring Resource Center and facilitated in partnership with Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership. These webinars would not be possible without the planning team, which includes the mentoring partnerships shown on this slide. In addition to this webinar series, the NMRC provides resources for mentoring practitioners. At the end of the webinar, we'll provide more details about how you can access this free support. Before we get started, I wanted to share some housekeeping information. In one week, you receive an email with information about how to download a copy of these slides and view the webinar recording. You can also access this information directly by going to Mentor's website in the next week. And to continually improve this series, we're looking for your input. A short survey will pop up as you exit the webinar. Please take a small three minutes to give us your feedback. We want this to be a participatory experience, so please use the question box to ask questions throughout the webinar. Melissa with Mentor will be queuing up questions to share with panelists during the Q&A portion of the webinar. We may not get to all questions because there are several hundred of you on the webinar, but we will do our best. The questions that we share with our panelists are generally ones that broaden or deepen the conversation. First, to get a sense of who is with us today, we have two short polls. So launch the, the first poll. What is your experience level in the mentoring field? Ah, so we have quite a bit of experienced people in the mentoring field on the call with us today um, and a few beginners. So um, let's launch our second poll. What is what is your role in the mentoring field? Please select one of the following. All right, great. We have a lot of practitioners also in the field um, with mentoring today. A few researchers, some TA providers, and some others who have joined us in our webinar today. So we welcome everyone and think and hope that today's information will be applicable to everyone on the line. So a little bit about me. Uh, as your facilitator, I am a um, mentoring professional of over 15 years, and I'm a senior manager now at the Memphis Grizzlies Foundation and direct our youth mentoring partnership, which is a localized part, uh, affiliate of the National Mentoring um, partnership. And on today's webinar, we have two great experts who will be talking about sports-based uh, mentoring, Thomas Padro and Joel Katz. All right. So our first panelist is going to be uh, Thomas Padro from Up To Us Sports. Prior to his current position of training manager, Thomas served as program manager for Up To Us Sports out of the Miami office. 
And prior to joining Up to Us Sports, he worked with the Miami Dolphins Special Teams Program and the Miami Marlins Community Outreach Department, specifically with their reviving ba uh, baseball in inner cities program. In addition to this work, he also coaches baseball at Cooper City High School. Thomas is a 2012 graduate of Anderson University, where he played Division II baseball. He holds a BA in Business Administration. Welcome, Thomas. Our second panelist is Joel Katz. <clears throat> Upon receiving his bachelor's in geography and sports management, sport management at the University of California, Santa Barbara, Joel Katz left Southern California to join the Memphis Grizzlies Foundation in 2010. Joel pioneered the development of the Grizzlies Team Mentor Program, the Grizz Fit Initiative, and today serves as senior manager uh, with the Youth Sports Partnership in the foundation. Merging a love for sport, play, and impact, Joel's current role helps to ensure that every child has access to a quality coach to guide him or her to success in life. All right. Right now, I uh, invite uh, Thomas to tell us a little bit more about Up to Us Sports and sports-based mentoring model. Thank you, Desiree. Um, hello to everybody. Um, so a little bit about Up to Us Sports. We are a national nonprofit organization um, with 10 offices here in major market cities in the United States. Um, what we focus on is sport-based youth development, uh, or SUID, which I might use the, uh, the acronym SUID every now and then as I talk here. Um, but what we really focus on is placing training and supporting coaches that will then mentor their youth athletes. Uh, we ourselves that work at Up To Us Sports full time aren't uh, kids facing, and so we don't work directly with kids, although most of us outside of our everyday work with Up To Us Sports are also youth coaches. I believe a lot of us at the high school level. Um, a very strong part of our model to support coaches that are from the communities uh, in which they're now coaching. So there's so many great things that they can bring to the table um, that somebody couldn't who, who might be two communities away. Um, so we, we're very much looking forward to bringing in and placing and supporting those coaches any age um, above 17, 18 years old to give back to their community and to serve as youth uh, coach mentors. So a little bit about the Up To Us sports model is that uh, our, we do a lot of training. So our trainings are actually very active. Uh, we don't make coaches or participants who come into the training perform any high-level fitness tests, but we do play games that you would normally see take place in a sports program or in an after-school program. This allows us to introduce games that coaches can immediately use right after their training. So immediately coming from one of our training, you can take this piece of information that you game that we played, take it to your program and get the outcomes that you're really looking for and so many other different outcomes. Uh, it really lends itself to the experiential side of our training. So you're going to be in environments that look and sound and feel just like what our training offers. Um, and it's that our, our belief that this is the best way for coaches to learn this and then to apply it so that they can feel the confidence to immediately go back to their program and then continue or start implementing these new practices. Uh, the experiential side goes well beyond that. So our coaches deliver scripts that goes uh, past 50 plus hours now. Um, but it's not just what you get from our script. It's also what we are doing around that. So we're setting up intentionally this environment that we want our coaches or our participants who are at the training to then create with their youth. So a few examples. It's fun. So we know that play is fun and sports are fun, uh, but if there's somebody who comes to our training and maybe they're just not into it that day, then we're going to find a different role for them because it's our job as a coach to then keep these kids in the program, keep these trainers and these coaches who are coming to us in the program. So we're going to find a different role until they're ready to take that next step. We create opportunities to matter, which we know through research actually does uh, a lot of good for children who have experienced uh, large amounts of stress or trauma in their lives, which we'll talk about a little bit later on in the presentation. Uh, we like to build pro-social connections anywhere we go. So the same way that we know kids need a large network of caring adults and caring peers in their life to be successful, we're going to create that through our training so that our coaches can take that right with them. Uh, and we use grouping strategies, attention getters, and energizers to do that. So we lead coaches down a sort of four-level path of certification in sports-based youth development. 
So the very first one uh, that you'll find is the building key. And what we mean right here is we want to build relationships. Everything starts with relationships, and relationships on their own move people and guide people down better paths. So we know that in order for any kid who is in the communities that we serve in, we need to build that relationship for them to take anything that we're saying seriously. And that's where it always starts, and that's where it always jumps back to when times get hard. So once we build that relationship out through many different practices, uh, we then go on to healing. We know that even if we have this relationship and we have all these great things that kids can learn in our programs, whether it's sports skill or life skill, uh, we can't do that if kids are actively suffering from trauma. So we need to then take sport and take all the healing aspects of sport and of competition and use that to heal our kids so that we can then get them to a point of building competency and building skills through the platform of sports. The next one is then growing. So after kids are, are healed and we've built these relationships, now we want these kids to grow and learn those skills that we, uh, that we know kids need, you know, uh, discipline and having future focus. All of that in addition to being a better scorer. Uh, being a better team, being uh, somebody who can pick up a, a defense, read a defense. All of those things we need our kids to learn and grow in that way. And then thriving. We know that there's going to be a lot of times where we are uh, really in a, a high stakes moment. And sports is that amazing platform that you can teach kids to be able to deal with these moments in a way that is supportive. You have your teammates around you. If it's more of an individual sport, you still have your group of coaches and your group of supporters that are around you that are going to be able to help you thrive through this uh, challenge, which you're going to need later on when you have a uh, professional career or you're in school. That sounds awesome. Um, an awesome model uh, with Up to Us. And, well, we know that mentoring works with youth success outcomes. Um, but what do you uh, think uh, or consider to be the benefits to sports-based mentoring? Thomas? And further, why should this field put an emphasis on sports instead of focus solely on the relationship? Yeah. Um, and I guess you can see in the slide, the first one that really comes to mind for us is, you know, play is fun and sports are a form of play. So sports are fun just naturally. You get a chance to go out and be with friends or be with uh, supporters and peers and coaches, and you get to move around and be active and just have fun. So it, it's an amazing platform in itself. Right? And fun all by itself is a huge benefit that we look for in a lot of our programs. It allows us to release sort of uh, the pressures and the stresses that come throughout life that might be negatively impacting us. Sports are also naturally uh, physically active, so that has a ton of great benefits, right? With the current obesity crisis, um, you know, all throughout the world, but especially here in the United States, um, and the sedentary lifestyles that come with technology, which is amazing and growing so much, right? But with that comes a different type of lifestyle. We know that kids don't have to go out and go outside and go to a park in order to play with their friends. They can log on, uh, you know, their, their PlayStations or Xboxes and then jump on and talk to their friends who are either a house away from them or, you know, a few states away from them. Uh, and it allows us to do different things. There's a ton of research, again, that we train all of our coaches and inform them in that physical activity helps kids do better in school. They literally perform better on tests and perform better in class if they are physically active. And then it allows us to better manage stress. Physical activity and sport is itself stress. You are running for a long period of time. You are exerting energy. But at all times in sport and in physical activity, if you have that caring adult with you and if you have you know, great teammates with you, you can take a step back from that stress. And a lot of times in life when we are dealing with sort of the other stresses that we know go on in the communities that we serve, you can't really take a step back from that. You're sort of stuck. So if you're stuck in it, we're going to have allow you to figure out how to deal with it and so you can get to a point where your network is strong enough, your skills are strong enough that you can take a step out of that. But I think an area where sports really stands above other activities that kids can get involved in, um, you know, and there's no, not throwing any shade on, on any uh, other activities such as, you know, band or musical theater or just regular performing theater, any activities that kids can find themselves getting into. I think where sports stands above that is how youth experience their progress. Being able to not only see yourself get better at something or see yourself uh, complete a task faster is great, but also being able to feel it. 
you feel that progress in your body. You feel yourself getting stronger. You feel yourself getting quicker. And you are able to see and feel all of these things that go on in front of you on the sport field. It just allows for kids to feel really what we do something which we deal with a lot in life. Um, we, you know, we tend to not take risks. So, and not not only do you see and feel your progress from this, but there's this automatic feedback loop that happens. So when you make a pass on a basketball court or in a soccer field, you make that pass and you automatically see if it was too hard, too soft, went to the left, went to the right. You know, there's somebody else cutting in front of the pass. So you see this and you get this automatic feedback loop where now you can get back with that positive caring adult who is that coach, and then they can course correct with you. So rather than an academic test where you're trying to figure out whether you got better at uh, algebra throughout the week, you take a test, and it usually takes about two days, and you're sitting there thinking, how can I continue to get better? Do I even need to get better? In sport, I think it's just above and beyond because of that automatic feedback. That sounds awesome as well. Um so a little bit about according to the elements of effective practice for mentoring, which are the research-based practices for quality mentoring program, training is a key for success. Um, how does Up To Us train coaches, referees, community partners to focus on the relationship while they're playing the game? Yeah, uh, and I guess just a little bit more on how we train in general. Uh, we like to think of we inform coaches and we inform mentors about current sport and youth development research and practices that are going on in the world. And then we activate them to use the knowledge and experience that they already have. Uh, while we continue to add some techniques and some strategies to their coaching tool belt as they go along. So we don't, again, we, we like to bring on coaches who are from the communities that we're in because one, they can speak to a lot of these uh, things that kids are dealing with today. Because they they are part they themselves are a part of this. They themselves are a huge part of what makes coaching and what makes sports successful. If they've gotten themselves to this point where they feel they can coach kids and, and they're in a good place themselves, they have the answers to a lot of it. We just want to add on. So at no point throughout our training or throughout our coach placement program are we telling anybody that, you know, wipe everything that you've learned about coaching off the table uh, because we have all the answers. Right. We, we ourselves are coaches. We ourselves sometimes run into difficult situations where we don't know what the answer is. So for us, it's we're using all the research, we're using all of the different experiences that we have, and then we're adding on to these coaches' tool belts because they're already amazing. Um, so we, we want to always shape it in that way that you know we, we don't have all the answers. We're going to give you all the answers that we have um, and just add on to what you already do that's awesome. In, in its simplest terms, how we train these coaches and referees and community partners, we're just we're encouraging sport-based youth development coaches to do more. So not just show up to a practice and say, all right, we're just going to run through the basic you know, ground balls and fly balls, and then we're going to hit some batting practice. We're coming into our program having planned well ahead of time. So we want to be intentional about everything we do. And it's easy for us to be intentional about the sports skills when we talk about sports. Uh, it's easy for us to see what happens in a game and say, you know, we weren't doing great at rebounding uh, last night. So today, all we're going to do today at practice is rebound. That's fantastic. But how are we using that platform more? So we see that our kids are not as disciplined or maybe not using the type of future focus that they need to. These are life skills that we know kids need. We want to highlight that as well. So we are intentionally building a plan that not only works on rebounding, but works on discipline, works on future focus where we're tying those together because that's how sport goes to the next level. That's how sport-based youth development coaches do more. Uh, we prioritize relationships. Again, it's always going back to relationships. They mean so much uh, in, in life, not just in sport, but in life. So we always prioritize them. We inform coaches with the best uh, practices and, and information about trauma and stress and uh, how the brain operates. And we allow coaches to be able to separate the child from the behavior. With sport, and especially youth sport, there's a lot of emotion that goes on in it. Um, not just from the kids, sometimes also from parents and coaches as well. But when we're dealing with kids and dealing with anybody really, we know that when people are triggered, when people you know, sort of fight for what we think are you know, there's no reason, or they yell at people for pretty much no reason, it's a reaction that's happening you know, within them, uh, physiologically. 
so we allow coaches to you know gather all this research and then really identify that they need to separate the child from the behavior there are no bad kids it's just bad behavior and that's that's something that i think will fight to our grace there are no bad kids it's just bad learned behavior that they have and we can help them change that so that's that's really the first step of that one um and then i love talking about referees um uh, <laughs> you know referees catch a bad rap in the sports, uh, especially I think youth sports and high school and college sports, they really catch bad raps from a lot of parents and, and coaches themselves. Uh, so what we do and what a sports-based youth development coach would do is, you know, they would invite referees to practices and scrimmages so that they can get out there and kids can know these people who are making the calls throughout games. If you know your kids are, are those who are not going to react well from the stresses of having a whistle blown in their face or being singled out as, you know, hey, you, you made the foul and this is why your team is losing 15 yards right here. So we bring them out to practices and scrimmages and make sure that we're sort of uh, getting rid of that authoritative part. There's always going to be something there, but you know, these are people who are supposedly the most knowledgeable in the sport. They need to know all the rules, all the things that go on, and they can be very helpful for kids just like coaches who know all this information, referees would know even more than that. So they can help our kids. So we, we sort of game plan with referees beforehand, before games, uh, to say, you know, this, this kid is coming on and, and they're going to pitch for the first time today. So, you know, if you see anything that's going on, please feel free to step in and give them some advice as well, because you know your stuff as a referee. So, you know, we activate them in that way. And then we also discuss at length when we talk about community partners and our assets and important pieces of uh, context within our communities. Coaches aren't going to leave our training as certified social workers. We tell them that up front and we remind them all the time throughout. But what we want to make sure of is we identify partners in the community that we help youth in their programs. And this is actually a session in our training where we sit down and just sort of mind map uh, this, you know, quote unquote context map to talk about here are your assets. Here are the things that are going on that we need to be aware of, but here are your assets. In addition to us set up to us sports, in addition to the amazing people around the country, uh, you know, that are on this webinar that are, uh, you know, over in Memphis at the Grizzlies, we want to make sure you have all the information you need to in case there is a moment where, you know, maybe we can't handle or we're not set up to handle that type of situation. Thank you. <clears throat> so a growing trend in mentoring is centered around trauma-informed care. How do you integrate, and I know you mentioned this earlier uh, from a, a previous question, but how do you integrate trauma-informed care into the work you do? Yeah, so again, it's uh, our, our coaches path early on in the slides. Um, you know, we need to help kids heal before they can grow and thrive. So um, trauma sensitivity, sensitivity is at the heart of everything that we do as coaches and as sport-based youth development coaches. We also truly believe that the trauma-sensitive coaching practices aren't just good for kids who are, are who are who have been affected by trauma, but it's all, good for all kids. Right? Even if you are somebody who is maybe from an affluent neighborhood and just you know doesn't really deal with a ton of the stresses that we know a lot of other kids are dealing with, trauma-informed and trauma-sensitive coaching is great for all kids and is very beneficial. So, um, you know, we we make sure we highlight that as we go throughout. Um, a huge part of being sensitive to these matters is, again, just means being informed on these matters. And it's unfortunate that uh, it's not widely known that the number of youth that suffer from PTSD in the community that we serve in are, you know, substantially more than those that are returning from overseas who have served our country. I mean, we need, everybody needs to know that. They need to know that this is what the kids are dealing with. Because it's sort of in the, it's in the light, the national spotlight or the, the global spotlight um, when it comes to veterans, which is incredibly important. Uh, and the kids are dealing with some of this stuff as well. So we inform coaches and mentors a lot about they just think sound good. So a lot of studies on adverse childhood experiences, right? Um, they're things we, we assume coaches, they're not things that we assume coaches would know. We're going to make sure we inform them on this. Um, all of the findings that we have. So also, uh, a lot of research from Dr. John Rady uh, about zero period PE, where it was sort of this intentional focus on zero period PE, um, where kids were doing, you know, all sorts of health and fitness before class, usually before their hardest class, uh, and then going to class and actually performing much better that they even, you know, entered into a uh, 
international math and science competition and were able to score incredibly high. Number one in the country, I believe, in math and number six in science or vice versa there, one in science and six in math. Um, also, the study of you know the California Education Department and seeing that direct correlation of kids who score higher in their physical fitness tests were scoring higher academically. A lot of the studies that we, we bring up and, uh, you know, coaches love hearing about them is the studies that are being done with stress management in the brain and physical activity done in rats, um, you know, how rats respond to physical activity and then being, you know, given a very high stress situation and how they respond and what their brain actually does. And then after our coaches are informed about all these amazing things about the brain and about how trauma affects us, uh, we go back to relationships. Relationships matter so much. We continue to build our evidence base by discussing the vital connections and how a caring adult relationship can significantly increase a child's likelihood to be resilient. So studies such as, uh, you know, figuring out what factors allow kids to be more resilient. These are actual studies that are done that we gather information. Studies on chronic homelessness and what the reason is for folks being chronically homeless. And it comes down to relationships. Then after that healing process happens with these kids and our coaches start to see that, then we can build these skills and allow kids to learn how to thrive in high stakes environments, um, you know, giving them the tools that they need to be resilient and bounce back from the adversities that, again, we know kids are dealing with. And it's, it's unfortunate, it's something we would never wish upon anybody or hope that anybody ever has to deal with. And our kids are dealing with it. So, again, this is at the sort of the forefront of everything that we're doing in sports-based youth development um, or trauma-informed coach mentoring. All right. Well, thank you so much, Thomas. Um, now to both of you, I'm sure that uh, you all both have had some challenges with this model of mentoring. Um, first, if we can have Thomas, Kellen, if you can share a little bit of what are some of the biggest challenges you've experienced within sports-based mentoring, and then Joel, um, you can follow up with one major challenge. That'd be great. And then both of you think about how did you overcome them? Awesome. Uh, so I think perception is a huge challenge uh, in the sport-based youth development, sport for development or trauma-sensitive field. Uh, there's a strong perception that goes with coaching and that goes with sports. And you know, a lot of time that's why uh, sports are being cut from schools and being cut from different programs because, hey, sports are fun and all, but you know that's just what they are. So let's make sure that kids are learning academically and getting tutoring and all these different things that are also amazing for kids. Um, but sport has so many more layers. So the perception of what sport means and then also what coaching means, not just, you know, what defines a good coach. So, you know, we see very winning coaches who I think a lot of folks um, identify with as good coaches, like the, which who, who are good coaches and winning coaches. And I'm sure they do a lot of great things right. But you see sort of the, uh, you know, the Bobby Knights of the world, the people who are sort of yelling really loud and creating these negative environments that might work for their kids at that level. But then you coach how you were coached, right? And you teach how you were taught. So that sort of trickles down to the youth side. And, you know, you define a good coach as somebody who looks just like a Bobby Knight, right? One of these coaches who are yelling and very loud and in people's face. And that sort of is uh, the perception of coaching, but also just, you know, who can be a coach and sort of what the, uh, what the buy-in for coaching is. It's not just a parent who is driving kids to soccer games and, you know, just standing on the sideline and giving a tip here or there. These are people who can have you know, amazing success with helping kids learn skills. So um, that, that's, a few of the challenges that we see in sport-based youth development is all around perception. Okay, great. And Joel, you, do you have one major challenge that you'd like to share? Yeah, sure. And I think to piggyback off of what Thomas said, you know, our, our challenge, uh, one of the challenges I've seen um, is, you know, the commitment to training. You know, as with any quality-based youth mentor program, the framework for sports-based mentoring and sports-based youth development takes training and behavior change in the way that coaches coach. And so the challenge is that some coaches or programs may think that additional sport isn't needed and that in their coaching practices and might be hesitant to value training as a non-negotiable component to their program, um, which is kind of, uh, as Thomas was saying, you know, sports can be kind of old school in that way. Um, and But I, I have met many of coaches um, from across the country who have walked into these sports-based youth development training sessions with a perception of what it was going to be like and what the outcomes were going to be um, at the end of the training and then left feeling 
you know, and surprised, inspired, and hungry to apply these new tools into practice. Um, so, I, you know, for me, I think the challenge is really uh, making a real commitment top down to changing the way that your coaches coach, um, and then ultimately equipping them and supporting them to do more. Um, so for us, we've overcome that by really deploying coaches, putting them out there, starting with a small core, and um, just putting them into play. Great. All right. So again, thank you, Bud. Thank you, Thomas, um, for those wonderful uh, tidbits, and welcome you, Joel. Um, and if you could tell us a little bit more, a little bit about the Memphis Grizzlies Foundation, Grizzfit, and its sports-based mentor model, that'd be great. Great. Well, thank you, Desiree and Thomas. I'm excited to chat with you with you all about uh, Grizzfit and the Grizzlies Foundation and what we're doing out here. Um, as we heard from Thomas, the Up to Us Sports and Sports-Based Youth Development Model, or SBYD, as I'll start using it, uh, really starts uh, with building relationships, which is core to the mission of Grizzfit. The Grizzlies Foundation exists to increase the number of youth with access to quality mentors interested in preparing them for success in school and in life. To us, coaches are mentors. They share the same responsibilities, but operate in a different field of play. We look to leverage the unique role of coaches to teach skills and cultivate experiences that can extend beyond the sports setting. To do this, we must start by reimagining the way that coaches coach and restructuring the access points to movement for kids. Our strategies begin with identifying a scalable, began with identifying a scalable model to hit home on these goals. They're all intertwined and integral to each other's success. And as we'll see on the next slide, I've provided a few different a uh, few of our different goals and strategies. So to begin, you know, we're really looking to grow the number of students in Shelby County with access to innovative youth sports programs, but that's really conditioned on leveraging this unique role of coaches to help prepare those students to be successful again in school and in life. Um, we're looking to increase the quality, of uh, quality and quantity of coaches in Shelby County, ensuring that those coaches are trained, have the skills to build relationships, teach sport and behavior skills, and then most importantly, you know, really drive these coaches into the task of continued education. Along with that, you know, we're really looking to develop and kind of activate a community of network organizations that are looking to utilize sport as a catalyst for change. And so on this next slide, we've got kind of a little breakdown of uh, really where Grisfit, uh, how Grisfit was developed, where it fits into the research. And as you'll see, um, or as you'll hear, a Grisfit coach, um, we really focus on making sure they're developing meaningful relationships with their players. Again, building positive, inclusive team culture that uses, that extends the skills being taught within the programming setting outside and into life, into school and beyond. Uh, our coaches do more, like Thomas has alluded to, which includes attending training and becoming certified as SBYD coaches. Uh, we've been partnering with Up To Us Sports for, for the last couple of years to develop and localize a coach certification model to fit the need of our part-time coach core. We uh, train, certify, and deploy Grizzfit coaches across two levels, uh, level one coaches and Grizzfit lead coaches or level two coaches. The primary difference between the two is that lead coaches have more macro roles. They are the coaches of the coaches and deployed contextual to the sites where they're serving. Level one coaches serve as direct coach mentors with a, with a matched cohort of kids. Our, our model uh, aims for a one to seven coach to kid ratio so coaches can manage the safety, space, and satisfaction of their participants throughout each session. We really do try to focus on not, uh, not messing with that ratio so we can start focusing on the relationships. Um, last month, we, do, we introduced trauma-sensitive coaching workshops and certified our 30 Grisfit coaches as trauma-sensitive SBYD uh, coaches. And then lastly, the final component, and actually the first part of our Grisfit certification is the developmental relationships training which was developed by the Search Institute. This workshop frames coaches as developmental mentors and shares many of the same themes and research that the SBYD training uh, alludes to. We have done a little bit of massaging to sportificate this session, but it really has, it really has served as well as the tip off and tone setter for the rest of our sessions, or uh, the rest of our training. I'll talk a little bit further about evaluating impact when we take a deeper dive into our research partnership that we work with our local children's hospital, Le Bonner. Uh, Children's Research Hospital, and we'll talk about those in a few slides. But lastly, these are localized best practices. Being directly affiliated with a professional sports team provides brand recognition, access to incentives, and of course, exclusive experiences. Though we are very strategic about how we integrate these key assets within our Grisfit initiative to ensure that we're teaching self-efficacy, aka kids have to earn everything. 
But as we'll see, earning is about effort. It's not about performance. Uh, our coach monitoring and support strategy, our coaches are our family. We look to select the right people and set high expectations from the initial interview. We provide them with weekly curriculum and site updates, and our lead coaches are always prepared to execute a coach huddle prior to each programming session. We also ask that lead coaches complete weekly reflection logs on Google Docs in order so we can get some real-time feedback from them. And then lastly, connecting stakeholders through a centralized database. We're working with Grizzlies Preparatory Charter School, our branded affiliated school here in Memphis, to implement a dashboard that pumps out reports for coaches and mentors, ultimately providing the opportunity for wraparound informed conversations with scholars. So we're really excited about that this year as well. So on to the next slide, you'll get a, you'll get a little, uh, a little uh, depiction of our coach commitment. Each GrizzFit coach commits to about 20 hours of training over the course of the school year, and they average about four hours of programming per week or two boot camps. The GrizzFit Kids Boot Camp is our programming model. It's an after-school and in-school based model. Again, similar to the coach ratio and the way that we deploy our coaches. There's about six coaches deployed for each session, about 45 kids, and they take them through a year-long physical literacy program, kind of teaching proper competencies of movement, reinforcing those with life skills, and a really kind of transparent and energized culture. So that's kind of how we deploy the majority of our coaches. And just to be very transparent right now, uh, the, the model might not work for every program uh, that wants to implement either sports-based youth development or sports-based mentoring, but this is what our coach commitment looks like. We really invest in our coaches and we really look to deploy them um, where we can both um, you know, give them enough investment to deepen their, their role within their programming sites and within our initiative as a whole. So on the, on the next slide, yeah. oh, go ahead, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, we'll say real quick before we actually move to the next slide, you know, just thinking a little bit more about this, um, it, are there any other models that you can think of um, that, that would fit? And maybe, Thomas, if you have any suggestions. Yeah, you know, I can, I can answer that. I mean, we've, you know, right. we're, we're deploying coaches. Um, as it said, you know, four hours a week might be a, a hefty commitment, um, it looks like on paper. And so there are strategic ways to deploy coaches at, you know, one to two hour, um, you know, clips per week. The, the, the interesting thing about movement programs as well is like coach movement programs with a coach mentorship twang is that, you know, the touch points and the dose, the weekly dosage, both at like a movement to see movement progression and at the coach mentorship level. So um, we are, you know, working on other ways that we can scale coaches at less, less intensive and, Maybe not episodic, but you know, less than um, where where our group coaches are. If that makes sense. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. So I know from directing the youth mentoring partnership that community partnerships are key for youth development and mentoring programs success. Um, can you share a little bit about the youth sports partnership and a few of your learnings over the past few years with regards to community partnership building? Yeah. So as as you can see, there's a, there's a lot of different collaboration and partnerships. And we work with Up To Us Sports as our training, as our kind of training partner and um, some strategic support as well. We're, we work with, you know, some after school community centers, some, in, some schools here, partners here where we're activating uh, our coaches in public play spaces. So there's a lot of collaboration and partnership development that goes along with our initiative. Uh, for, for brevity's sake today, I'd love to focus in, though, on our research partnership, um, which, um, again, as we talked about, um, is with our local children's research hospital. So on, on this next slide, um, you'll see that, um, you know, when we really launched the GrizzFit initiative, we knew that in order to truly know what impact um, our program and coaches were making, that tracking and influencing physical and metabolic progression um, needed to be part of the story. So as part of our partnership um, with the Healthy Lifestyles Network at Le Bonheur Children's Research Hospital, um, we've been able to analyze the impact on physical and metabolic health uh, we, uh, it begins with the, our program and uh, the data collection really begins with what we call the GrizzFit Combine, which we modeled similar to the NBA and NFL draft combines as a fun way to collect data. So kids are coming and having fun, but we're getting, but we're able to really collect uh, information from them. The Combine happens four times per year and it's progression based as I've um, started to emphasize here, progression over performance. Uh, data collected uh, both at, again, baseline and end line. 
We've, uh, we've aligned our concept with physical and metabolic tests and indicators that can be compared against normative data sets. And so what that means is that we're collecting a lot of different demographic data on all of our kids. And obviously we've, we're collecting, you'll see in a few slides, we're collecting um, a few different uh, data sets on their physical metabolic health. But in order to really compare those and measure fidelity, we're, um, we're calculating Z-scores and able to really analyze that against gender, sex-specific, age-specific data sets that are out there. Um, much of our early learnings and recommendations, though, have been applied to program operations, really ensuring, most importantly, that participants are present during our GRISFIT combine days and giving coaches a strategic role in collecting and using the data. In the short term, we have observed some transformational behavior change. It's difficult to quantify whether that was a result of maturation, coaches, or some other influence or combination of the three, but I personally have observed kids realize all sorts of things, but specifically a buddy of mine realizing he has, buddy Carlos realizing he has body awareness and needs to start taking more personal responsibility for his health, which I think is pretty deep coming from an 11 year old. Um, so we're really, this year we're measuring cognition and behavior change, which we're excited and think will provide some interesting needle moving insights um, this year. Building a culture of wellness. So through the power of coaching, we're, we're looking to build a holistic culture of wellness and fitness for our youth. It's not just about teaching form and physical fitness, like the proper way to run through a speed ladder, how to do squats or jump rope. We believe the model isn't holistic without an application to life skills, empowering kids to be good teammates, giving non-leaders the chance to shine and praising effort over performance. On the next slide, we're going to get, you'll, you'll see kind of an overview of our 10 different data sets that are collected at each of the GRISFIT combines. Actually, that's the slide after this. Let me, let me read you through a few different learnings from our uh, uh, partnership building. These, are, these have come out of the past two and a half years of um, working with Labonner, and these are just kind of some macro learnings around data collection. Um, uh, data collection, and also these are some uh, partnership kind of program implementation learnings as well. Um, really ensuring there's clearly defined roles, timelines, and deliverables. But again, with the nature of this work, uh, really deploying coaches as mentors, it can be disruptive um, in, in the initial kind of inception of it all. So really be flexible that uh, those workflows and goals may change a little bit. Uh, as, as both Thomas and I have emphasized, training is integral to program success. It's also integral that it's not just coaches that are trained. Ensuring that all the stakeholders are, are, are available and are attending some component of the training so they can start to get their minds reframed into um, what sports-based mentoring really is and looks like. Um, with our partners, I've definitely had the luxury of building in time for strategic conversations and informal brainstorming. Venting sessions are important as well, uh, but this is really kind of, as, we, as you launch the initiative and you throw it all on the table, you know, these are three important kind of buckets to help really codify your product. Um, and then a few different kind of learnings as it relates to program partners. Uh, we really lean on our site champions. They're our on-site program partner or pro program kind of uh, touch point. They're responsible for accountability of the kids, the integration of the staff at the local site, and uh, recruitment of the kids as well. And Thomas talked about this, and we really focus on this as well, which is, you know, contextualizing our program into each of the communities and organizations we're serving. And then kind of to go along with that, really creating synergy and organization operations. We've got a pretty transparent culture that our coaches put out there and that the Grisfield initiative is really built upon, as do a lot of the organizations that we work with. So finding common threads and building bridges within the culture is a, is a nice starting point and access point to kind of authentically bringing coach mentorship and sports-based mentoring into your, uh, your program. Hey, um, great information. So, yeah. So our, our outcomes are key for funding and sharing with other key stakeholders. We do know that to be true. Um, so what are your learnings, again, thinking about measuring, uh, tracking an impact, and talking a little bit about the Grizz Fit Combine? Yeah, so we, uh, we collect 10 different uh, data sets, physical and metabolic. The metabolic tests, as you can see, include height, weight, waist circumference. With those, we're able to calculate BMI. And then we also collect date of birth. And so with date of birth, we're able to calculate their Z-scores, which allows us then to compare data across other kids who are in similar uh, categorical, similar categories, I guess. Um, so, so that's, that's kind of, uh, that's, that's where BMI and Z-scores fall in. Our physical tests, as you can see, include the two-minute walk, the vertical jump, push-ups, curl-ups, shuttle run, and sit and reach. What those measure are endurance, 
speed, agility, coordination, flexibility, balance, and strength. So as, at each kid, third through eighth graders, have 10 different data sets that we're collecting on them. These results are inputted into a dashboard and then provide us opportunity to analyze the data based on each of the individual categories. And on the next slide, we've provided some of our data, um, kind of lessons learned while we've been uh, collecting and really analyzing data. Um, as you can see, um, excuse me, uh, tailoring your recruitment data and really framing your program is, is, a, is the first place to start. Um, one of those ways is age appropriateness. We've really learned that that's a key factor in understanding impact versus natural maturation. If weight loss is the goal, uh, one, a piece of advice we found is that uh, it's important to target kids that fall into that certain BMI category. Um, we've, we, we actually found that most of our kids aren't as overweight as initially thought. Um, more touch, touch points or a higher dosage per week means more fitness. I think that's pretty straightforward. And then tailoring outcomes to curriculum. Sport can have pretty transparent outcomes with fitness development and sport specific skill building. And so if you can build those into your curriculum, prepare your coaches to deploy those, then you can really start to see some transparent outcomes um, in a short period of time as well, especially if they're behavior or skill based. And um, yeah. All right, well, so thank you. Thank you so much, Joel. Um, love hearing all about Grisfit and uh, sharing in the uh, success in the last few years with it. Um, thank Thomas also for sharing about Up To Us and I've learned more about, uh, and we've all learned more about the Up To Us uh, mentoring model um, and sports-based mentoring and sports-based youth development, SBYD. Uh, before we leave today, I would love for you to share, um, both of you ought to share any advice um, that, that you can give to mentoring practitioners uh, who are considering adding a sports component to their program. Uh, Thomas and then Joel, if you can tag along. Yeah, um, so, and, and it's going to sound funny when I say it, but uh, my advice would be just stop considering it and do it. Just go for it, right? Everything is out there that you need uh, to be out there to back it up. The research and uh, the experiences from just different sport-based youth development organizations, organizations across the country. Um, and I know that's a lot of times easier said than done. Right? But allow your community partners um, and allow like-minded youth development practitioners practitioners to help you. There are a ton of us out there doing these things. Uh, up to us, sports started as a coalition builder and just bringing people in who are like-minded, who want to get together and build research and build different practices for this field. Um, so we would be you know, incredibly happy to help you all link up with the right people um, if there are still questions. And I think it's another good piece of advice would be, you know, your, your program or your league, your league doesn't have to necessarily be a on sports league, although there is incredible power in managing your own sport league uh, because you're able to then change the rules. If there's something that is not very trauma sensitive that happens in basketball, if you have your own league, you can shape that. You can have it be uh, as trauma sensitive as you want it to be. So there's incredible power in that, but it doesn't mean you have to have a full on sports league in order to be an SBYD uh, organization. There are many ways to incorporate sports into a lot of different settings, a lot of different time frames. We have coaches in our coach program who see kids three times a week for only about 45 minutes a day, and some coaches that see their kids every single day of the week for three to four hours uh, just working on sports. So don't force yourself into a model that isn't right for your context. Again, take in your community context, take in the context of the youth that you're serving. Don't, you know, try and force uh, let's say soccer on a on a group that is actually really looking for basketball. Like that's what drives Miami here um, is very football based, right? So we're not going to try and force something that kids don't want to do on them. We want to make sure that we're catering to our kids and then um, eventually working from there. And then another thing is just gauging the competition. Your program can absolutely be one where all you're doing is practicing, building skills, and um, you know, setting up competitive environments without actually being in a league and playing for a championship or you know a trophy. Um, and if your kids are ready for that, then it doesn't have to just be practicing. Get out there and compete and allow these kids to uh, learn from you and learn how to deal with high-stakes environments and competition. Well, Joel? 
Well, that was beautiful, Thomas. I don't have much else to say. The only thing I'll tag along to kind of reinforce what Thomas is saying, because I echo everything that, that he just said, you know, the context and, you know, finding just don't stop considering it and do it. Uh, the one thing I would say is start by investing in a small but strong coaching core. Uh, prioritize quality over quantity in those coaches until you get your model right. And, you know, identify the right partners and resources, um, bo both locally and, you know, nationally, both. Um, to, to ensure that um, the resources nationally, but locally find the right partners to ensure kids are going to be there. And, you know, that's really key, you know, to running any sort of program is making sure kids are there. And then if you deploy the right coaches and quality based coaching, you might, you, you're likely to keep the kids in, in there. So um, I would say, you know, don't outkick your coverage too quickly and really identify a core that you can manage relative to your capacity and then start to get, um, you know, a team that, that coaches differently and really grow from there. If I can jump back in real quick, um, I, I just want to say just in our partnership with the Grizzlies and knowing Joel and everything they do over there is that they actually, they know their, their community so well and they know their, uh, their youth and, and the coaches um, in the different community centers so well that they, uh, Joel mentioned this the other day, is that, you know, they're, the Grizzlies are, are a basketball organization, but they go out there and they have uh, a parkour uh, program where kids are doing, you know, active free running and doing these amazing things in a town that is, you know, all built for basketball. So you'll eventually get there. You'll jump out there and you'll be doing all the amazing things that, that the Grizzlies are doing. Um, but, you know, again, it's, it's go with what, build the relationships with your community, with your partners, um, with the youth, and figure out what it is and work your way up. Um, they do a ton of great stuff at the Grizzlies. That's, that's something that I wanted to make sure <laughs> was said here because I think it's fantastic. Thanks, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thomas, and thank you so much, Joel. Um, we have um, time now for um, question and answer. And like I said, after all of the wonderful information, um, you may just have a few questions. And I'm going to turn it over to Melissa English with Mentor to uh, provide our question and answer session. Great. Thank you so much, Desiree. And I have a ton of questions, but I'm going to prioritize as how they came in. My first question is for Thomas. Uh, what is the age range of the Up To Us Sports youth, and how is your program evaluated? So, two-part question there. Yeah, um, I mean, we, we work with all kids. Um, we work with all kids that are, you know, I, I think from kindergarten through senior year of high school. Um, in terms of uh, evaluation, we evaluate kids um, from second grade to 12th grade with um, the, I guess, the, uh, the survey-based uh, quizzes that we have, and we do a physical evaluation as well. So our coaches and our coach program are the ones that are sort of administering this monitoring and evaluation uh, aspect to the coaching. So physically, we do the PACER survey. Um, we we have coaches, you know, set up. If you haven't heard of the pacer survey, uh, the pacer test, it's the deep test cone set up 20 meters apart from each other, and you run back and forth from cone to cone based on when an audio recording uh, would beep. So it plays music, and you'll hear a beep, and then the kids run to a cone. They wait there until the next beep. Um, and it's sort of the the gauge that people are looking for physically. Um, if you're looking at really the basic beginning, it's sort of replacing that mile run that we always did in. Uh, physical education class in school, this is what we feel is getting the better results for physical fitness. Um, and then through those surveys on life skills, and the life skills that we highlight are called our high impact attributes. These are eight attributes that research is showing to be the, the ones that kids need to be the most resilient. So to be successful later on in life, to be able to bounce back from adversity, um, these high impact attributes such as future focus, plan B thinking, situational awareness, um, social confidence. We have coaches administer surveys on this um, to get a sense from the kids on how they're growing. We also have coaches do reflection logs. We have an online system uh, called America Learns where we uh, send out reflection logs once a month to coaches. It actually was two times a month before. Um, and we're gauging high impact attributes in the coaches as well. We know that we are sort of funneling everything down to work with kids and that's where a lot of the, the attention shines, but we want our coaches to be valued in what they do, right? Again, it's not just 
the the parent who's dropping kids off. You, you as the coach are important in these kids' lives, and we want to make sure that our program is benefiting for you as well. Um, we do training feedback and assessments. We do memory recalls through, uh, you know, text-based surveys, um, and any sort of thing that our funders, you know, the uh, under core funders and here in Florida, Volunteer Florida, private core funders like uh, Laureus and Nike, and then we have um, some coach slots from the Office of Juvenile Justice. So uh, just anything that they give out there, that's what we assess. Awesome. Well, that was, thank you for uh, answering that so comprehensively. Um, my next question is for Joel. Um, what kinds of cognitive and behavioral data do you collect? And there is another part to the question. Is there research underway to collect social and behavioral indicators? So that's a, a big question as well. So. It's a big question that we're working with as well. Um, we're, um, we've piloted a social emotional learning assessment through our program, which was a self-reported assessment that the, that the students, that the kids did with their coach mentors twice a year and um, we, got, we we did get some interesting feedback um, where we actually uh, through one of our partner sites that they collect uh, behavioral and cognitive data on their students and so through the dashboard that we were actually talking about we're going to be able to kind of in, infuse that along with the other metrics that are part of our program so as far as what the data is saying and what we're collecting it's all still a relatively new um, to me things that we were looking for and have seen in the past um, or excuse me, things that we've uh, included in our social emotional learning assessment were um, things like activity at home and uh, choices, sleep patterns, personal responsibility, um, you know, their willingness to participate in class, um, just kind of a lot of uh, context clues around their behavior in school, at home, and in the community. Um, so to answer, um, I don't know if I answered that question specifically, but that's really, you know, kind of where um, as we put our emphasis on, you know, physical and metabolic data collection analysis coinciding with the social emotional learning and behavior cognition where we've discovered that the, it, uh, that a lot of the short term kind of movement is going to be in that realm. And so um, that's, again, I look forward to and love to share some of the learnings that we have um, from this fall semester and from this year. Um, so that might be more of like a follow up and stay tuned answer. That's wonderful. Um, Thank you so much. And that was very comprehensive. I appreciate it. Um, we're going to take a little different turn here. And I'm going to ask this of Thomas first. Um, are there different coaching strategies and different types of sports that you use in rural areas versus urban areas? Thomas? I can take this one first if you'd like. Um, Great, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, sorry. No, I, I think r rural versus urban, you know, Thomas alluded to us having a parkour club. We also have a rugby club. Um, we've got a running club, and we are an NBA team in an urban core. And so um, I would say that um, where you play and the access to play is kind of relative to the community and the, that's one of the pieces of community context that we look into is where are kids and what are the play spaces within their communities and so sometimes that you don't have a choice in that um, but if there there's all sorts of things that you can pop up on both fields and fields and in community centers I mean you can play soccer and basketball gyms and you could play um, field hockey on I guess that's where you play on a field but um, as far as like the difference between rural and urban areas, you know, I take kind of a more macro uh, perspective to that question where uh, I think kids just need to move. And so as long as you're getting them moving, you know, there's all sorts of innovative ways to keep them moving and engage them while they're moving and, you know, teach lessons while they're moving. But rural, rural or urban, um, you know, I'm a soccer player at heart, so I can play, you know, that's the kind of sport where you can play at a global game because you don't need a ball or fields or goals to play it you can manufacture you know a, a trash bag and wrap that in tape and now you've got a ball so I think that's one of the unique elements and features of sport is that um, while you may you know have this vision of beautiful you know well manicured grass and courts with lights on them and and all that sort of thing you don't need that in order to pull off an effective program or intervention um, again that's you know the coaches can drive a lot of that out of there and 
um, just really taking kind of a non-traditional look to what how you see sport is um, is kind of the beginning to answering that question. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Um, you know, we, we have everything that we do, we do some sort of skill based training, uh, for coaches directly about sport, but it's not, you know, a direct here. We're going to teach you this, you know, activity to do if you're a basketball program, if you're a golf program, um, it, it is really everything that Joel said. It's, it's taking in your surroundings. It's really understanding what's, what needs to go on. So, you know, we don't want to sort of look at uh, a rural community and say, you know, this is what is going to be played here. We have this, this aspect of our training that isn't groundbreaking. Uh, it's called team time where we just sit down with our kids and we sort of flip the natural uh, debrief of a game or a practice where a coach is doing most of the talking and saying, here's what I saw, here's what we need to do. And it's the kids who are sharing. Um, and you may be limited to a, you know, 20 foot by 20 foot uh, small room downstairs in your office, in your office building. Um, but the kids want to play soccer, which you need a ton of space for, right? So it's our coaches who, who know these sports, these sports and these activities best, and they are going to implement the youth development tactics through whatever they're doing. And again, we, we are a coalition builder at heart. Um, we are always around, even in our coach program, we're not a funder that says, here's some money, go do, you know, what you do and come back in 12 months and let's see the results that you get. Our program managers here are, are talking to their coaches one, two times a day, really, uh, getting in touch with them and making sure that everything's good. So I think it's, uh, yeah, it's all dependent on, on I think I think the kids, if I was going into a program, it starts with the kids. What do they want to do? What What's going to keep them in our program? Because we're so much more than the sports or the activities that we teach. Um, so what's going to make this the best program for you? That's so awesome. Thank you so much. And I'm going to actually piggyback on what you just said about, you know, having those program managers really checking in with the coaches. How do you recruit for effective quality coaches you know how do you get those coaches thomas first oh so, um so we we have a very strong relationship with any uh host site that comes on in our coaching program so we have a uh, mou period that goes around that uh people send in applications and then we talk to them and we go and visit some sites um, and we really get to know the organization well. And we honestly think that in the best case scenario, we, Miami is really huge. If, if folks who are on the call haven't been there. Um, so it's hard for us to say when we are sort of near the airport in one community to say, I'm going to send you this coach who I think is going to be great for your community 20 miles away, still in Miami. Uh, we, we want our host sites to be able to identify the people that they know are going to be great for them. We are absolutely going to step in. We uh, talk to different AmeriCorps alumni programs. We do a lot of different research in the communities. We go out to many different information gathering sessions to get contacts and get names of folks so that we can link them up together. But at, at our heart, we want our organizations to feel comfortable with saying, I know somebody who's already great with the kids who can use the added tools that you're going to bring to them. Um, in the sport-based youth development field, and then that's what we're going to go. We're going to continue to build them professionally, uh, whether it's in a workforce development setting or it's in a coaching setting. We're going to build them to be, bring them to their fullest potential. Um, so we, we really rely on the community to help give us the, the great coaches that are already out there that, again, just need to be activated. That's so awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, Joel, actually, um, can you give us any tips on, you know, recruiting effective quality coaches? Yeah, so we obviously we're, we're localized. So we're and, you know, we're pretty in touch with our market and the different communities. And so we we look to leverage some key players around here, whether that's um, we we it's hard to like generalize where our coaches come from because they kind of are very wide spectrum of ages and um, and come from a few different um, walks of life and places. And so our we've, we've recruited coaches from campus, uh, different campus ministries. We've recruited coaches from local um, gyms or fitness programs. We've recruited coaches that are student athletes or former student athletes from local sports teams. 
Um, we've recruited coaches just through our networks and the folks that we've interacted with through all of our programs. And they've kind of ultimately made up this um, pretty sweet dynamic core that we call our, you know, Grizz Fit coaching staff and family. And um, one thing that we do do in our interviews, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just say this, when we interview a coach, I, one of the first things I tell them is that, um, you know, this is a pretty non-traditional interview. So, you know, let's get comfortable. We want to get to know you. We want to get to know um, your skills, your passions, your heart, all of these sorts of things, you know, and, and then I'm pretty clear about, um, you know, talking about setting the tone and the expectation from the get go, you know, it's, I'm, if you can't tell over a webinar, I'm pretty energized and passionate about this work. And so, you know, to have, uh, I try to impress upon that with our coaching staff and, you know, not scare them or overwhelm them, but like get them excited about both what it takes to be a coach and what it takes to get kids moving in our program and then empower kids to move and make positive and healthy choices outside of our program. It takes a lot. And as Thomas has alluded to coaches, our coaches do more and we hold a really high standard for how our coaches operate in the community and the face that they play for our organization. And, and, and most importantly, the, the examples that they set for kids to be lifelong, you know, lovers of movement. And so, um, yeah, we, just paint the picture. We throw it on the table. We tell them what the training expectation is, what the expectation both at like a fitness level for our coaches, which isn't super crazy, but you're moving and you're, you're out there. And then like what it takes to under, to get the kids, you know, moving and empower these, these sorts of skills. Like we really try to paint like a very vivid and clear picture. So our, in every interview, a coach is either like, Oh my gosh, I love that. Let me sign up. Or I can't make that commitment. And for us, that allows us to really identify um, our candidates right off the bat. And um, we've retained 100% of our coaches for the last two years. And we feel like um, that's both um, a function of the way that we set the expectation from the get-go and how we're able to deploy them to meet those expectations. So um, that's kind of our part of our strategy. That's an amazing strategy, though. <laughs> um, and actually, Joel, I, I was wondering if you could answer, um, start answering this next question, if you could. What's your experience with cross-cultural mentoring? You know, uh, have you had any challenges with that? Or, and if you have, how have you dealt with them? <sighs> Sports are such an equalizer. Once you get moving, you kind of, like, forget whatever you've been thinking about. Um, and so I, I haven't had challenges with them. Maybe it's um, maybe I've been naive to them or I haven't seen them, but, um, our coaches make up a, you know, a wide range of cultures and walks of life as do, you know, some of the kids that we serve. And so, um, sports are just such a great equalizer. And when you're infusing this kind of like high octane coach mentorship style with this transparent Grizz fit culture and they're moving and sweating and smiling at the same time, there's just a lot of layers of stuff happening that, um, you know, again, it just ladders back to ensuring that you have the right coaches and the right folks in place that are willing to walk into any gym, park, or community center or school and um, kind of execute the game plan. So I personally have not. I don't know if that's, if that's the right answer or wrong answer, but oh, um, no. <laughs> we've, yeah, we've been, we, we've had some pretty, pretty sweet experiences we've seen from that on that level. I guess I guess I can kind of uh, talk a little bit um, about it. We also, um, you know, here at the youth, because Joel and uh, with, with Grizz Fit, he is part of the youth mentoring partnership, um, and so we often have uh, supplemental um, trainings that some of his coaches go through as well uh, on cultural competency and critical mentoring. So um, we also feel like that is important to talk about, you know, even along the way, so it doesn't have to be in the very beginning of a program but it can be all along the way offering kind of supplemental trainings that deal with cross-cultural issues. Awesome. Thank you so much. And that's, um, I think that's all the time we have for questions, but everybody did great. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we appreciate both Joel and Thomas. Uh, we have a lot of information um, out there. And again, if you would like to reach either one of them, uh, we can provide their um, information to you. Um, we also encourage you to check out the Office of Juvenile Justice and the, the, uh, Delinquency Prevention National Mentoring Resource Center, uh, their website for no-cost uh, mentoring resources to help you apply evidence-based mentoring practices to your program. The OJJDP NMRC provides evidence reviews on mentoring models 
and mentoring for special populations, implementation resources from training manuals to mentor guides, uh, reviewed by the NMRC Research Board. And there's a blog featuring innovations and best practices from mentoring practitioners and the opportunity to request no cost training or technical assistance. Additionally, we encourage you to encourage we encourage you to register your program with the Mentoring Connector, a national database of mentoring programs. This zip code searchable database allows mentors and mentees from across the country to find your program and is connected to LinkedIn, MBA Cares, Mentor.gov, and so many other avenues of free program promotions. As a reminder, one week from the webinar, all attendees will receive an email with a link to the Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series webpage, where we'll post the recording, slides, and additional resources. And also, don't forget, we do want your feedback. At the end of today's webinar, please answer the short survey and help us to make this series even better. Uh, stay connected. Be sure to visit the CMWS page on the Mentor website for an archive of all past webinars and information about upcoming webinars. So thanks to everyone for joining us today. Please join us next month on October 19th uh, for our next webinar on creating an effective team. Everyone have a great weekend.